welcome. Uh, again, uh, we uh, thank you for coming and participating, even if uh, you're at home and if you're here in person. Uh, I wanted to make a couple of announcements. We will continue Bible study uh, on this uh, Tuesday evening at 6.30, and we're still in Romans 13. Uh, we're talking about the practical aspects of doctrine and how it impacts the way we live and how we uh, love. So that's where we're at right now. And again, I invite anybody who's interested, you could jump on anytime. You don't have to say, well, I missed the first 13 chapters or anything like that, just come. And uh, we are preparing for a, another study after we finish this one. And again, uh, we haven't made a decision as to what we're going to study, but if there's something you would like to discuss, come bring your ideas and maybe that will be the one uh, that we will begin discussing. So please, uh, there really are no stupid questions. We invite everything. Okay. Um, okay, today is a communion service. So if you are at home and worshiping with us, uh, please have the elements ready uh, for that segment of our worship service. Okay, this upcoming Saturday, uh, we are having a garage sale, a church garage that benefits Emmanuel Union Church completely. Uh, we have uh, many items uh, that we are trying to sell. Uh, and if you can be there, we really would appreciate you there. Uh, I know most of the work, believe it or not, has already been done by Bunny and Nancy. And we're thankful for their uh, hard work. They've been pricing things, getting ready to be out on the tables. Uh, but we need you to put a good face on for our community and show Jesus Christ to everyone around us that come into our buildings. So we do need your help. Okay, let's begin our worship service. Oh, come let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully <clears throat> to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. We're going to sing now, praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. And I'm going to ask everyone in the sanctuary, if you would like to stand, you can. If you want to remain seated, you can as well. It's up to you, but let's praise the Lord. The heavens adore him.
Okay, as I mentioned today, we have the privilege of sitting at the Lord's table, and we're going to use as a confession of faith the Nicene Creed. Uh, Christian, what do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father. Through him, all things were made for us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and was made human. He was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will never end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. And with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified. He spoke through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We affirm one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look forward to the resurrection of the dead and to life in the world to come. Amen. Okay, uh, we, I think by now we're getting used to the fact we are not taking an offering, uh, but there is an offering plate. Uh, for your convenience uh, when you exit or enter uh, the sanctuary. Uh, also, if you are at home, you still uh, can send in any of your tithes and offerings uh, via uh, PayPal or Venmo, or you could just mail them in the old fashioned way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day that you've given us, and we pray that you will um, just be with all of us, help those of us that are struggling in one way or another to just um, continue on and trust in your faithfulness to us. Father, we pray for um, our prayers this week as we pray, we praise you that Jean's sister is home, but as of last Sunday has developed shingles and is now on meds and recovering from that. Father, her body's been through so much these last months. We pray that you will just take the shingles away quickly, help her recover, and we're thankful that it was discovered quickly and early so that she didn't suffer too much. We continue to pray for Tom Cressy, whose kidneys are not, whose kidney, he only has one, is not doing well. We continue to pray that uh, you will just uphold him and uh, be with him. Father, we pray again for Ben Eichen, who's still in the hospital with bacterial pneumonia. We pray that you will get him healed soon, and Father, that he will get a placement at Egger. 
Father, we pray for Liz that you will just be with her, strengthen and encourage her because I know physically it's very exhausting as well as when you're not feeling well yourself, just traumatizing for your own body. We pray that you'll strengthen Jen and Mark as they are uh, taking Liz back and forth to the hospital and just protect all of them as they're in there. We continue to pray for John's friend, Phil, as his heart is failing and he's waiting for a heart from the transplant plant list. We pray that you will just be with him, strengthen his heart and uh, give him a heart soon. Father, we pray and continue to pray for Bill. We pray that you will heal him and he'll have no more heart problems. And we pray for Sonia that she won't worry and she'll trust that you're in control. We continue to pray for her cousins, Joan and Michael Johnson, um, as Joan is recovering from COVID pneumonia and Michael, who is in ill health, taking care of her. Protect him and just uh, heal both of them. We continue to pray for Naomi, who's continuing to heal from her spinal surgeries. We pray for her. We pray just that you'll strengthen her emotionally with everything that's going on in her life and her kids' lives. Father, we pray for Stephen, her son. We pray that you'll work in his life miraculously, and we pray that her daughter's family will continue to get the repairs of their homes so that Naomi can have a little bit of a break and a respite in her own home by herself. We continue to pray for Don's eye treatment as he's having trouble reading. We pray that you will um, strengthen his eyes and just give him the ability to see well. We continue to pray for Ann Holland's grandniece, Jillian, and her husband, Patrick, who is in the Air Force and in Iraq. We pray that you will keep him safe. And we also pray that you will be with Jillian and as she takes care of um, her two little boys by herself. We continue to pray for the Hamlins the, who lost their uh, mom and stepdad, those seven and 10 year old kids. We pray that you will just be with them, heal them emotionally, and Father, be with their grandparents and keep drama from their home. We continue to pray for Allison, Karen Cole's daughter, who's in treatment for cancer. Be with her and strengthen her, Father, and we pray that you will heal her of cancer. We pray for little Charlie, whose leukemia is back and he's under treatment. We pray that you'll strengthen his little three-year-old body and uh, give him strength and take uh, leukemia away again, Father, and keep it away. We continue to pray for baby Ella, who's been removed from uh, by CPS for her home and is living with the pastor and her family. Father, we pray because the uh, law enforcement has now charged the mom with a criminal case. And Father, it is such a mess. Um, so we pray that you will just work all of these things out and for your will and according to your perfect sovereign will. And Father, we do pray that you will show the truth in this whole thing and that um, baby Ella can go home to her family soon. We continue to pray for Jake and Jamie Highland, Father, those fire victims. We pray that you will just be with them, be with them as they heal physically, as they have to work out their burns every day and stretch their skin. And since so much of their skin is burned, Father, we pray that you'll heal them not only physically, but you'll also strengthen them emotionally and mentally um, with the loss of their two children and any future children that they can physically have themselves. Father, we pray for those who are battling COVID currently. If they're sick, we pray that you will heal them. Father, we pray for those long haulers who continue with COVID symptoms. Father, we also pray for those who have gotten the vaccine that are now ill and having heart issues. We pray that you will heal them as well. Father, we pray for those families who have lost loved ones from COVID or other reasons. We pray that you will give them comfort and peace and uh, just help them through this time. We pray for those struggling at home emotionally, for those who miss their family, friends, and church family. We pray for those people that you will just encourage them. We continue to pray for those businesses and the unemployed and the struggling people out there everywhere, all over the world. Um, I especially think of Nepal where they're locked down and they can't even work and they do not even have food for their families. Father, we pray for those countries. You know, it's easy for us. We can go to our 
local grocery store, but they're not even allowed. So Father, we pray for those countries where people are starving and have no food and have no money and no means to work. We pray that you will just provide from them for them and use us to provide for them. We continue to pray for our country, for our president, vice president, senators, congressmen and women and judges. We pray that your wisdom will impart to them and that you will rule through them, Father. We pray for our policemen and women, safety around the country. And uh, we pray that you will just be with them on a daily basis as they go out to keep us safe. We continue to pray for the leaders of New York. We pray for Governor Cuomo that you will just be with him and Father, just uh, break his heart and have him convicted of whatever he's done or, if he's justified, give him, give him justification. Father, we pray for Mayor de Blasio as he leads New York City. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus who taught us to pray. Yes. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And, and forgive, forgive us, us our debts, as we forgive, forgive our debtors. And, and lead us not in temptation, but, but deliver us from evil. For thine, thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the, and the glory, glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Okay, again, we're going to continue the song that we closed with last week. Uh, yet not I, but through Christ in me. If you'd like to rise, you can. Otherwise, you can be seated.
So a uh, husband, please be seated. A husband uh, attended a Lamaze class uh, with his wife. And uh, the instructor said, ladies, exercise is good for you. Walking is especially beneficial. And gentlemen, it wouldn't hurt you to take time walking around with your wives. Uh, the room grew really quiet. Finally, a man in the middle of the group raised his hand and says, is it all right if she carries my golf bags as well? Uh, too often, we leave the Great Commission uh, to people who feel that it's the burden of someone else. It's not uh, your job. It's not my job. It's someone else's job. But the Great Commission is meant to have an impact on not only the church, not only the lost, but each and every one of us as individuals as well. Oswald Chambers wrote, Jesus Christ did not say, go and save souls. You see, I think many of us are so results oriented that if we don't see somebody immediately become a believer after we've told them, hey, you know, I go to church. You know, you know, I, 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 I'm religious, and we expect immediately the heavens to open, the dove to descend upon them as if that was it. And then we say, well, didn't work. There's no sense. I must not be called to that task. That's not my gift. So we throw up our hands in defeat, and we have done with it. And the, re the reality is, I hope you've been hearing the word of God, not Charlie Baldini, because Charlie Baldini means nothing. What I, my opinion, it means nothing. But as we've been looking at the word of God for quite some time now, we've been seeing that salvation is of God. It's something he does. But then when it comes to the discipleship part, that's where we get involved. First, we begin by being discipled, and then we carry on by discipling others. That is the way the church has always worked since its inception in the New Testament period. If you look at Jesus, he spent three years with those disciples. When you look at the four gospels, immediately it's easy to walk away from the direct impact he had on the disciples and just think about the impact he had on the people he came in contact with. But the reason he spent three years with the, the disciples was to disciple them so that in turn, they can continue that ministry of discipling others. And that's how the church perpetually has been continuing since then. And I feel that here we've been given the baton. It's been passed on to us. And I'm not talking about Emmanuel Union Church. I'm not talking about everybody that's logged on this morning. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in general, generally speaking, the church has been handed the baton to continue this. And for one reason or another, personally, I think it's because people look at us now as having no effect no impact. They don't go to the church anymore. I mean, I hear a lot of stories of people from Emmanuel Union Church who grew up here and how the church was always central to their life. And they still have these fond memories of what it was like growing up in a fellowship where people actually cared for one another, interacted with one another, worked together shoulder to shoulder. They had a common purpose, a common goal. And today it's not like that anymore. And I'm not talking about Emmanuel. I'm talking across the board. People are happy being alone. People are happy living autonomously because what do you have to do now? You don't have to go out somewhere else in order to find interaction. You just flip on your TV, you flip on your computer and boom, you're there. And that's not healthy because we were meant, we were created to be in fellowship with one another 
So it used to be that people came to the church, they went to the church because they were looking for community, they were looking for hope, they were looking for help. And the church had been given that baton from previous generations. And I think they started feeling, well, maybe we really are meaningless. Maybe we really are irrelevant. I mean, everybody else feels that way about us. Maybe it's true. Maybe I'm the one that has lost my senses. And what we've done is dropped the baton. And the result is look around. It's not Emmanuel Union Church. Churches are closing everywhere today because people have convinced us that we really are irrelevant. Why keep our doors open? We're, we're just kind of running on a treadmill wheel and we're going nowhere. That's not true. And I hope you don't believe such a horrible lie because we are the hope for a world of darkness. We are the lights of the world. That's why Jesus has us here to remain being a light so that people will look at us, not to say, oh, Charlie, you are someone special, but rather, oh, Charlie, what is it that you have? That's different. What is it that is going on in your life that I don't get at home, that I can't get at work, that drinking does not give me, computers do not give me, money doesn't give me, all these things that I want to try to find on my own, I've been failing over and over again. What is it about you? And you could say, not me, Christ in me. And hopefully, by God's grace, that has been a divine appointment. That's something that God had orchestrated. And then all of a sudden, you become friends with that person. Friendship is still valuable. I know a lot of us feel that friendships, uh, I could go on the, how, how, how many of you are on Facebook? I'm ashamed to admit it. What do we call all those people that are linked to us? How many of you do you really actually know? My wife, I, I'm gonna let you in on a secret. Everybody who's listening, I'm, I guess this is not a secret anymore, but I get friend requests like many every day. And I'm, I, I really don't care. I deny them all. They're not friends of mine. I, I value you as friends. We're being convinced that those are friends and they're just a bunch of nameless, faceless people that we never met, we probably will never meet. But we call them friends and we're satisfied with that. That's the problem. We're satisfied with that being considered a friend. They're not your friends. I don't know if you need a wake up call. I think a lot of us, we feel that they become a notch on our belt. It's almost as if by saying, yes, you're now my friend, you can accumulate all these numbers of people and you could say, well, I've got a thousand friends. Or you know, somebody else could come along and say, well, I, that's nothing, I've got 1,200. And somebody else, I got 2,000. Those aren't your friends. And we've watered down the whole idea of friendship. When I came to Emmanuel Union, we're going on 20 years this year. In September, it'll be 20 years that I've been here. Time flies when you're having fun. Don't laugh. <laughs> uh, 
um, I, I remember the motto or the slogan, a friendly church with a vision for the future. I'm not even gonna talk about the vision for the future part. That's not what I'm, but I'm saying to have as your identity, a friendly church. That gives us a bar to live up to. That's something good. I'm glad that that's there because we need to be a friendly church because people are really looking for something that we're supposed to have, something that we're to offer them and communicate that. As Jesus said, all authority has been given to me. Go as you're going more accurately. As you're going, make disciples of all manners of people, all, all manners of nations, it says. Bapt I mean, not only for Jewish people anymore, it's for everyone. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy. Look at that. There's the Trinity. This is important. I don't know how far I'm going to get today, but I hope to cover that. Baptizing him in the name of the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That wouldn't be there if all three were not one God. Three persons, one God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Equal in that. We just, how many of you paid attention to the Nicene Creed? We just recited it. Did you see that's all in there? They're all God equal with one another. They are completely interwoven as one God. Three persons, three distinct people, co-eternal, co-essential, co-substantial in every way. They work together. They personify what it means for us to be a friendly church. We're to reflect that unity. In fact, when you read John chapter 17, which is really the Lord's prayer to be accurately speaking, because the one that we recite every week is not the Lord's prayer. What's the, what would be the more accurate name of that prayer? Anybody know? The disciples prayer, remember? Teach us how to pray. So Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. That's the disciples' prayer, which is just a blueprint or format or a pattern for prayer. But John 17 is what's called the high priestly prayer, the Lord's prayer. It's Jesus' prayer. And he's praying intimately to the Father. And we're in there. The Holy Spirit is in there. His relationship with the Father as being one is in there. It's a beautiful prayer. If you haven't read it, pour your heart over it because it's amazing. What rich words to see how he was mediating or interceding on behalf of you before you were even born. It's beautiful, but you see that, that unity that the Trinity has with one another. And then he says, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Four gospel accounts contain all that Jesus commanded them. And I guarantee you, we cannot even touch how many things Jesus commanded his disciples or taught his disciples to pass on to ultimately to you and me. And it doesn't end with us. That's the, I know a lot of us, we like to think that the world revolves around us, but it doesn't. And the good news is, as this is instilled in you, you are then gonna pass the baton on to somebody else. Who's gonna instill it in somebody else and future generations, because that's how it's always worked. We are results of what Jesus did with the original disciples. We are a direct result of that.
They, we always talk about doing an ancestor search. Well, they are, if you are, if you are believers, they are your true ancestors. And you could trace it right to them. In fact, you could trace it right to Jesus Christ, our creator. Well, one of the cardinal disciplines of our faith is in sharing it with others. Jesus' final instructions before his ascension was to live lives which reveal him. And as you do, teach them to observe what I, I taught you. I think about the church as being the only cooperative society in the whole world that exists for the benefits of its own non-members. Could you imagine that? We're the only industry, whatever word you want to use there, that does not exist for ourselves, but we exist for the people who we don't even know right now that someday may fill this pew. I, I, I look at many of you, and as I said, 20 years, and many of you came since I've been here. Now, a lot of you have been here way before me, and I'm not touching that. You guys are pillars of this church. But new people have been coming. And to know that this really has happened before my eyes in your life. And I thank God for that. There's nothing more exciting for me than to look out here and look at your faces and see what God has done and what God is doing in your life and my life. You have no idea the impact that you have on me. I'm always hearing people tell, oh boy, you impact me. You did something you said. You don't know the way you impact me. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't even be able to get up here because I'd be like, why even bother? But even if one of you showed up, it's worth it. Every one of you is worth it. But one time, you, as well as myself, as well as everybody here, was not part of Emmanuel Union Church. And you came along, and God kept you here. And that's the hope that we have for new people coming. That's the value that there is in telling people it's safe to come here. It's a good place. It's not like the world. We're different. We really are friendly. We really do care about you. Come and relax. Come and taste. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Well, as I said, it's not our job to save people. That's his job. He gets the glory for all of that. But to think of the way he calls us to be part of it is amazing. Three years stretching them, teaching them, training them so that they in turn can have that same influence upon us. I don't know how many of you know this about the Civil War, but at the beginning of the Civil War, both sides had excitement. And they actually volunteered for service because they believed in something, the South as well as the North. After a while, they began to see that it was going to be a lot longer than they expected. So they started a draft. But in the draft, there was a little clause that was put there, I guess, for the rich folk 
for the people that were supporting the war efforts on both sides, as well as for the politicians. And you know what the clause was? You're gonna love this. That I can pay you, let's say I'm wealthy, I come from a wealthy home, I could pay you $3,000 in their day, which is the equivalent of $100,000 in our day, I can actually pay you to take my place in the war effort. So of course, if you were poor and for some reason you couldn't, you couldn't be drafted, let's say hmm, you were not an American. You were not drafted if you were not an American but I can pay you $100,000 to take my place in the war effort. And the people who then took the money and went as my substitute will say, a lot of them were not able to fight. Many of them were drunks. Many of them were indifferent about the whole thing. They just wanted to make $100,000. And then it got worse. What they did was, let's say you paid me $100,000 to take your place. Don't forget, there was no computers there. The world wasn't as tied up as it is now. And then I make $100,000 and I go to Mel. Hey, Mel, how would you like to go to war? Well, I don't think I want to go. I, I'm not eligible to fight. And I said, oh, hey, Mel, I'll give you $50,000 cash. Now you want to go? And Mel's going, sure, I'll go for $50,000. That's what happened. So they started subcontracting the workout to other people. By the time people got to the front, they didn't care. They ran away. As soon as a bullet shot, they ran to the, they went west. They wanted nothing to do with it, but they had the money so they could leave. They were called substitutes. How many of us, not a manual union, I'm not picking on a manual union, but how many churches hire the professionals to do the work of the ministry so that they will be substitutes? So you won't have to. You pay me. And I have to come every week with a polished sermon. Otherwise, you may not be happy about it. You know, after all, I'm here to make you happy. Or I may not bring enough people into the church because that's my job. That's what you're paying me for. And it's ultimately an abdication of what all of us have been called to. I'm the substitute. Jesus spoke about the hireling. I do care for the sheep, but there's a lot of hirelings in pulpits today that do it for a profession. I remember when, uh, when I uh, told my mother that I was going to Bible college, I have to understand being growing up in Brooklyn, in Bensonhurst, going to Bible college, going to be a minister. What is that? You know, of course, to her ministers were cop priests, you know, and they weren't married. My mother knew I couldn't do that. I'm a marrying kind of guy. 36 years. And I love my wife more and more each day. But my Aunt Lucille, who was very pretentious, very wealthy, she was the one that had the money in the family. When my mother told her, my aunt said to her, oh, that's a good profession. He'll make a lot of money. I'm still waiting, by the way. It's not a profession. It's a calling. We're not supposed to be doing anything just for the money. I mean, I do have to eat. I did have to support a family. You understand that much. But I never expected to make a fortune here. I serve you. That's what I'm here for. 
but you are to serve one another. That's what you're here for. And we serve one another by discipling one another and furthering discipleship. Now, the good thing about what I have going, and it's unfortunate because I recognize the problem here, is that I make sure that I have adult Bible studies. If you remember when I first arrived here 20 years ago, there were no adult Bible studies in Emmanuel Union Church. I started that. There were Bible studies for communion, up to communion, or conf I'm sorry, confirmation. And then that was it. I started Bible studies immediately and I still have them going on. And that is my means of discipling a large group of people. But in reality, discipleship begins in our homes. We are discipling our children. Husbands are discipling wives. Wives are discipling husbands. And it carries on and on and then reverberates within the church. That's what Jesus is trying to get across here. We are all in this together. It's not a profession. It's a calling that all of us have on our lives. Well, again, uh, the new birth of man's spirit by God's Holy Spirit means a birth of love for others. He actually part of that regeneration, that spiritual birth is to change ourselves from selfishness to selflessness. Where we start really thinking of others and their needs more than we think of our own needs. And that, I believe, is the biggest battle that must be conquered within us. That is the struggle because every one of us wants to be seated on the throne. We want what's best for us. I mean, carries on even into our own homes. Come on, how many of you? You go to the refrigerator and there's a piece of cake and your wife, your husband, your kids, they want a piece. So you cut it. And then you look at them and you say, hey, wow, this one's a little bigger. I'm going to take this one for myself. It carries on all the way through. And we don't even give thought about it. It's just, well, I'm the one cutting it. It's, it was my cake anyway. I'm the one that wanted it. I walked all the way to the refrigerator after all. I deserve it. I deserve it. Really? We deserve it? If anyone deserved it, it's Jesus. And here, he stepped out of heaven in a perfect relationship. I mean, you think of this. He had a perfectly content relationship. Father, Son, Holy Spirit in need of no one or nothing. And he stepped out of heaven to become a man to take on flesh with all our weaknesses and all our frailties and all our infirmities and whatever COVID was going around during his day, he had to, well, maybe I'll get it. Maybe I won't get it. Just like we do. Should I wear a mask or should I not wear a mask? He went through the temptations, the struggles, and then arrested for no reason. He did nothing wrong. When you read the Gospels, he was totally guiltless. And then the abuse, spitting, beating, mocking. I think the mocking may have been worse than the physical cruelty. What did he do? He created us. Talk about biting the hand that feeds you. 
and then ultimately crucified, hanging on a cross. And everybody continued to hurl and insult and spit and mock and say, good, he deserves it. Good, good, good. When in reality, he did it all for us. He did it so we could sit here comfortably today and discuss these things. But death did not have the final say. He breathed his last, he said, it is finished. He died. Three days later, God raised him from the dead. And he comes to his disciples and he says, okay, now I'm setting you loose. This is what you're in school for for the past three years. Go out, go to that world and tell them there's something more. Death does not have the final say. Tell them because he lives, you too can live. All your sins, all your hurling and mocking. Come on, every one of us, we mock God all the time. We curse at him under our breaths when things don't go our way. We question him, we doubt him. It's the same thing. He's feeding us, he's sustaining us. And yet, we hurl at him. We show contempt. We hate him at times. And yet, Jesus says, stop, child. Stop acting like a child. Look to me. Look to me and live. Trust in me. Today, we have the opportunity to come to our trustworthy Savior and sup with him at the table. Today is a day we come, and it's a reminder of the feast that one day we will have with him when he takes us home to be with him forever. I'm going to ask that you get your elements ready as we come together to share the cup of life. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. Let us pray together. We come to church hungry, Lord. We are hungry for comfort, hungry for love, hungry for a new way of living, hungry for your word. Thank you for giving us this place and this time to worship. And we are eager to taste your goodness in community with our brothers and sisters. Bless us as we feast on the bread of life today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I invite you uh, to this table in the name of the one who said, I am the bread of life. This is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is here that we remember how he gave his body and his blood to save us. The night he was handed over, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. He said, take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus, for loving, loving us. us. Even unto death. Yes. Send your spirit upon us so, so that, that we, we may know, know that all who eat, eat and drink at your table, table. In, in our congregation and around the world, are one body, one holy people. The bread of life, Jesus' body given for you, take and eat.
After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine and after giving thanks, gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, remember me. Let's pray together. Lord, give us clean hearts, forgiving hearts, praising hearts. As we drink this, we join with our brothers and sisters in heaven and on earth. <laughs> Given thanks to you in an endless song of praise. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for the many, that includes us, take and drink. We have come to the Lord's table. We have eaten the bread of heaven. The Holy Spirit will transform us from within so that we can see with the eyes of Jesus. Hear with Jesus's ears, speak with Jesus's mouth, feel the world as Jesus feels it. To taste and see that the Lord is good. Go into your weak, nourished by the bread of life. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing Rock of Ages. Again, if you'd like to rise, you may, as we sing together that beautiful top lady hymn, Rock of Ages. benediction now, but I, again, wanted to remind everybody, uh, we have an opportunity uh, to show our friendly faces on Saturday, and we certainly would invite you and welcome you to please participate in that. You don't have to stay the whole day, but just come for a while and fellowship with one another and let people see that Emmanuel Union Church really is a friendly place. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant 
brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you and me with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us that which is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. God bless you and go in peace. Okay, everybody, if you want to hang out for a virtual coffee hour, that'll begin now. For those of you who are in the sanctuary, I do just want to say, I don't know if you can still hear me, but um, if you can come at any point during um, Saturday, please come and uh, give a call to the church, letting Gina know that you'll be part of this. We also will have pizza and we'll take care of you for lunch because we're so appreciative of everybody helping. So please make sure that you all come because we need helpers. Happy birthday to Valerie Jacobson, Abby Blissenbach and Mary Brower this week. And next week is Casey Lynn Riemann. <laughs>